So good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us on Women in Football's latest webinar. We've been so grateful for all of your support throughout these webinars. Um, as you probably know, we did set them up in response to the COVID-19 crisis, and we hope that you've been finding them inspiring, informative, and will continue to do so as things start to get back to normal. We are going to be carrying on with our series because they seem to be so popular. So if there's anything that you'd like to see a, a specific webinar on, any topics in particular that you feel we haven't covered, or just that you'd like to hear more on, do email us women, uh, events at womeninfootball.co.uk. So events at womeninfootball.co.uk. Just drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. Um, this morning, I want to pass on huge thanks to Rachel Brown Finnis, Dr. Julia West, Chloe Morgan, Dr. Me Dr. Misha Jervis, and Nicole McClure. Um, we're delighted to have you all here today for what I know is going to be really stimulating and engaging. We've literally just sort of had five or ten minutes together um, and I'm just I'm so excited to hear from all of you. Um, I'm going to do biogs to everyone so that you, you all know um, the background of our amazing guests. Rachel Brown Finnis is a former goalkeeper who's played for England on more than 80 occasions. She also played for Liverpool and Everton. She signed for Liverpool in 1995 at the age of 15 and was there for three years during which she made her senior England debut. In 1998, Rachel moved to America and attended the University of Pittsburgh, where she not only earned a degree in sports science, but she was also named goalkeeper of the year every year. She also holds the Pittsburgh Panthers record for the fewest goals conceded in a season. Rachel signed for Everton back here in 2003, where she stayed until 2014. In 2010, she played in her second FA Cup final and she collected her first winner's medal. Rachel was also in the Team GB squad for the London 2012 Olympics. Whilst playing for England, she qualified for the Euros in 2001 and 2005. And in 2007, she went to the World Cup in China. In 2009, she became one of the first female players to be given a central contract by the FA. It really was a groundbreaking moment for women's football in this country. Since retiring in 2015, Rachel's worked in the media as a pundit and co-commentator. You probably saw her this weekend across BT and the BBC, and uh, she also writes a column for The Guardian on the WSL. Rachel's going to be our host and will um, be taking over for me shortly to talk you through the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, Dr Julia West is a senior lecturer in sport and exercise science at the University of Worcester and head coach at Worcester Goalkeeping, Goalkeeping, Goalkeeping Academy even. She holds a UA for B and FA Level 2 goalkeeping coaches license. Julia is a former goalkeeper who played for a number of years for top clubs, including Brentford and Oxford United. She earned her England University caps against America, Scotland and Wales. Julia read her BSc in sport from Brunel University, where she also successfully achieved an MSc in sports coaching. Both her undergraduate and postgraduate research projects related to goalkeeping and performance. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Julia. Uh, Chloe Morgan has just signed for Crystal Palace. She's a former goalkeeper for Tottenham Hotspur. She was a key member of the Spurs team throughout their FAWPL and FA Women's Championship campaigns and assisted the club in securing promotion to the Women's Super League for the first time in the club's history in 2019. Chloe is also a qualified civil litigation lawyer and has worked in London law firms full-time alongside her football career. During her legal work, Chloe has headed up a number of initiatives which have sought to increase the profile of the LGBT community within the sector. Um, Chloe's also just gone back into pre-season, so has just been filling us in on uh, how difficult that's been after uh, nine, nine weeks or four months in, in lockdown. So welcome, Chloe. Uh, Dr. Misha Javis. Uh, Misha and I were just reminiscing because uh, Misha was actually at our first Women in Football event in Spur, uh, which was held at Tottenham. Um, about 13 or 14 years ago. So I feel we've almost sort of come full circle and you, you've definitely been there since the beginning of women in football and, you know, so many years prior to that. So we're, we're so grateful to have your experience with us here today. Misha's a sports psychologist and programme development coordinator at London's Brunel University. She's also a founder member of the British Olympic Association Psychology, Psychology Advisory Group. She's worked with many international athletes and coaches from a variety of sports. She was also an international gymnast herself and coach and has represented her country at World and European Championships. Misha was appointed as a psychology consultant by the FA in 2002 with a specific remit to develop sports psychology through coach education. She's also taught on the prestigious pro license. 
Misha was the sports psychologist to the Lionesses and accompanied them to the, to the 2007 World Cup and the Euros in 2009. So I think Misha and Rach will obviously have lots of stories from both tournaments um, that they're going to share with us today. More recently, Misha's developed bespoke sports psychology programs within the men's professional game and is currently heading up sports psychology at the QPR Academy. So thanks for joining us, Dr. Misha. And completing our stellar lineup and live from New York City, everyone. Um, it's 6 a.m. in New York, so we can't thank you enough for joining us. It's uh, New York born Jamaican international goalkeeper, Nicole McClure, who currently plays for Sion Swifts in Northern Ireland. Nicole has a wealth of playing experience, having started out in the Long Island Junior Soccer League in 1998. She attended the University of Hawaii at Manoa and the University of South Florida. It was during her college career that Nicole played for the Tampa Bay Hellenic, after which she played exclusively for clubs in Europe and Israel. Nicole made her senior debut for Jamaica in 2009 and was a key player helping them qualify for the 2019 World Cup finals for the very first time. You'll probably remember Nicole because in the qualifiers, she was brought on as a 120th minute substitute for the penalty shootout against Panama in the third place playoff. And yes, Nicole saved two of the four penalties she faced. Um, so let, let, I'm sure we'll have some penalty psychology chat shortly. Uh, the rest they say is history for Jamaica who then made their debut at the World Cup in France last year. So I'm gonna hand you over to Rach. Um, she'll take you through the next 40, 45 minutes. Uh, we'd love to have some questions for you. So um, Rachel will talk you through how to do that, but enjoy and um, I will speak to you once, once Rachel and our wonderful guests have spoken to you. Thanks, Joe. Just realized I am hosting, so I'm just scrolling through everything I should be doing. Wonderful. This is a first for me, so bear with. Um, just first of all, ground rules for everyone who's in attendance. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself on the chat. Um, remember, please be respectful, keep it positive. If you do have any questions, then we will um, be able to facilitate those at the end. That's no problems at all. Um, as far as my lockdown experience, so each one of us is going to talk through our lockdown experience uh, over the last 10 or 12 weeks, give you a bit of an insight. Mine will totally be not goalkeeper related. So, uh, I don't tend to throw myself around on the ground anymore since finishing five years ago. Um, my lockdown experience has been a bit of a roller coaster, I have to say. Um, I think certainly the, the mental side of goalkeeping has really helped in coping with uh, lockdown because lockdown has been um, with my husband, who I'm not used to spending a lot of time with because he tends to work away. Uh, he's a caddy on the golf tour, so he's back out in America now. But to spend 12, 14 weeks together, wow, we've never done that in the 15 years that we've been together. Uh, so that's been a bit of a test. Throw in two children, four and age four and two. Um, it's been a wonderful opportunity for to have an experience that we will never have again uh, and couldn't have preempted having. Um, we've learned a lot about each other. I've learned a lot about actually working as a team, which, you know, as far as being part of football, I think has been very, very uh, useful, as I said, to have those kind of mental strategies in place and how to get the best out of each other, um, how to kind of coordinate things when I'm very much used to doing everything myself. Um, but it's, uh, it's had a real, it's made me really focus on what's been important for me, both up here and physically, uh, but also as a unit. So finding alternatives, always thinking, my philosophy has always been about control of controllables. Um, that's a philosophy I employed in goalkeeping and has transferred very, very nicely into everyday life. Um, and we couldn't control you know, the external situation but what we could control is our own moods, temperaments, physical and mental well-being. And that's been really important, getting my kids involved in physical exercise, being outside as much as, as we possibly could. Um, going down to the beach, which is just sort of 100 yards away, fortunately, has been really great for headspace on occasions. And uh, generally looking after each other. So I think a lot of the, the, the strategies and key characteristics and skills that I learned, inadvertently learned, I suppose, or well, purposely learned for goalkeeping, I've inadvertently really benefited um, what is my new life as a mum, uh, as a wife, and as a family unit. 
So uh, I've been very sort of pleased uh, to, to have recognized a lot of those skills during lockdown. So there's my kind of non-goalkeeper related lockdown. Um, should I pass on to Nicole? It's early, you've probably fueled up with caffeine. Would you like to uh, go next on your lockdown experience? Sure, yes, I am filled with caffeine. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. I really appreciate being on this panel. I'm kind of like starstruck at the moment. I grew up watching you, Rachel. Um, my lockdown experience has been a bit unique as well because as you all know, New York has been the hotspot for this whole thing. Um, in the beginning, I actually caught the virus in, in March and um, that was hell. Um, I wouldn't wish that on my, my worst enemy, but you know, I, I overcame it and you know, actually infected my mother, unfortunately, but she's all right. Um, so about maybe about a month or so, the first month or so, it's been rough um, because you know, everything was closed. I, didn't, I couldn't play, I couldn't train. Even my, my job working with children had ended, so that, that was kind of difficult. Um, but since we've opened back up a little bit, slowly, slowly but surely, it's, it's been a little bit better. Um, still can't work with kids. Um, normally I'm coaching. It's been, it's been kind of difficult because I still can't train with, with people. But I must say my fitness level has, has been good. All I do is run around the neighborhood and, and at the football pitch, which is open. Um, so right now I'm just you know, hoping and, and waiting for the next opportunity to, to play again. Great, thanks Nicole. Um, Julia, should we come to you next? I know you were in your pajamas last time we spoke. Um, <laughs> so well done for getting dressed today. <laughs> right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, well, my lockdown, I'd like to say it hasn't changed much except everything went online. Um, I was still as busy as ever. My, my parents and friends were, were asking me what new skills have I learned in all my spare time in lockdown to which I wondered where the spare time was because I seem to be working sort of 24 seven just to get everything online. Um, so I haven't learned any new skills, but I've been bashing away at the hit just mainly to negate my exercise of walking to the fridge um, and having a look to see what was in there. So yeah, I've had to sort of try and overcome that. And as we discussed earlier, um, yeah, my coffee habit is only one a day, but yeah, it's, it's um, from, from the coffee shop, although I've saved money, I think I need to learn how to make real coffee. So, uh, you know, that's probably one of my challenges that, that, that I should be looking at. And um, I've managed to get myself a new position, I think. I'm on trial this evening um, to coach for a local women's team for um, their goalkeepers. And they've got some really, really exciting plans. So I'm really pleased to be in there, or hopefully, uh, let's not um, jump the gun, but, but hopefully to be in there right at the start. So I've, I've really surprised myself at how with a little bit of more downtime that I can be extremely creative. And I've been coaching some of my goalkeepers online, which has been amazing uh, and trying to get over some of the messages and, and some of the things that I'd, I'd like them to practice during the week, you know, with their parents and against walls and all sorts of things to, to try and help with their interest as much as anything. Um, and, and we've come up with some fantastic ideas that I hope we can implement face to face. So I'm sort of, I'm looking forward to, slowly coming out of lockdown and, and, and hopefully not having to go back into any form of lockdown and, and getting more goalkeeper coaching because that's where I find my buzz really. So yeah, thank you for having me everybody. Great, wonderful ways of adapting, um, not being able to get your gloves on and on the grass but still being able to pass on valuable information to young goalkeepers. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, Chloe, should we come to you next? You sound like a lady playing as well as uh, <laughs> Being a lawyer, tell us what you've been up to during lockdown. Yeah, I mean, first of all, thank you very much for, for having me. It's, it's awesome to be on the panel today. Um, yeah, it's been a very mixed experience, really. Um, I mean, it's gone from, obviously, you know, the whole game completely stopping and then the kind of drama with, are we going to continue? Or is the season going to, are we going to be able to finish it off? And, and obviously, there was quite a lot of di disappointment at the start with, with us being sort of, you know, making our kind of debut into the WSL and then having it, having it curtailed um, a couple of months short. So obviously there was a lot of disappointment and sadness there. Um, in terms of kind of trying to pick ourselves up, I suppose there's obviously been a, a training program that we've tried to adhere to, which, you know, I've kind of gone through ups and downs with it really with motivation and trying to stay focused and trying to do what I can in my bedroom. But 
I mean, there's there's no kind of equivalent to you know being out on the field and having balls flying at you from from every angle and things. So um, yeah, it's been sort of difficult. And some days I've just wanted to just hide under my duvet really and just not do anything at all. And, and some days I've had so much energy, I just feel like I could run a marathon. So it's just kind of dealing with those kind of roller coaster of emotions. Um, and then sort of obviously dealing with the transition from uh, you know finishing off with Spurs and then going into to Crystal Palace this season. So pre-season's already started and they are working us very, very hard, uh, making up for that lost time. So yeah, and then obviously having to deal with the COVID testing, which is just horrendous. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else has, has had it done, but it's basically just this eight centimetre cotton bud that gets stuck right up your, your nose, um, which is just awful. So doing that twice a week is is something that I'm getting used to. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, also sort of going back to, to law. So started back on, on Monday, um, having difficulties with IT already. So getting used to to um, getting back to the IT department, which is, has been a big struggle. Um, but yeah, sort of dealing with, you know, going back to, to normal life in a way. So a lot of ups and downs, but things seem to be getting back to normality, which is, which is great. So yeah, looking forward to kind of, getting stuck into things and, and moving forward with the season. Great. And um, finally, we'll go to, to Misha. Misha, you probably tell us maybe what we should have been doing during lockdown or how well we've coped with all lockdown. Maybe your experiences um, with athletes during unique circumstances, such as, as what we've just been through. So welcome. Yes. So thank you. Lovely to be on the panel with everybody. Um, lovely, Brownie, to see you again and actually speak to you. Um, rather than waving at you on the telly um, but um, so I too got COVID um, early on I think it was around about April um, so I, fe I feel the pain Nicole um, it was uh, challenging but, uh, but um, I didn't get it really badly but I'm out the other side which is good so um, I've embraced yoga I do yoga every morning for at least an, an hour or so. And that is brilliant for just calming, focusing, creating inner strength. Um, one of the things that I do with the whoops, excuse me, um, QPR Academy is we do mindfulness every morning with the boys and actually we work all of those skills. Um, so I need to practice what I preach. <laughs> so I have been doing that. I've been doing a lot of one-to-one -one stuff. So as well as working with QPR Academy, I also work with a lot of first team players at Wickham. What a game. <laughs> so um, I was doing uh, kind of online um, work with a number of those players, um, which was important as well, obviously leading up to this kind of unique situation of these random three games. Um, so that was, that was very rewarding. And, and, a, and a powerful journey, a different kind of journey, but important. Um, I have been really busy. I haven't stopped. So like Julia, um, universities didn't stop. We just kind of tried to adapt everything and go online. Um, I put up a lot of resources for athletes to try and keep them engaged. So little videos that I made, little things to keep people um, kind of connected with what they're doing, little reminders. Um, Understanding that, yes, we can't control the virus and, and that control the controllables, Brownie, is a, a, a phrase I've used for, for many, many years. And, and you're absolutely right. And in these situations, it's how do, you, how do you find acceptance of your situation, but also still find possibilities for growth within it. Um, and uh, I, I was also working with a couple of athletes who were due to go to Tokyo so again, how we press the reset button for that, how we look for opportunities, how we change the narrative um, is, is really important. Fantastic. I now realise everything I've learned has come from Misha directly. <laughs> Some Mind of it, a little bit maybe. Mindfulness and yoga is something that um, is, I've practised on a semi-regular basis since finishing playing football. Uh, mm -hmm. certainly focus on that and mindfulness and uh, meditation I've been doing every Wednesday evening again by zoom because it's not available kind of one-to-one -one as I would normally have so uh, that's great to kind of uh, to find some similarities and uh, and know where I've learned it from so <laughs> probably remember my memory is not very good and I do believe that's down to goalkeeping as well um, now going back to goalkeeping 
All right, we'll talk to go back to Nicole for this one. Have you always been a goalkeeper? If you were, who were the people that you looked up to? And do you think you were born a goalkeeper? Or do you think, what characteristics do you think lend yourself to the world of goalkeeping? Um, well, I started playing at age eight um, as a midfielder. Uh, I feel like everyone starts in the field, field at some point in their lives. Um, but goalkeeping be became natural to me because I grew up playing basketball with my, my brother and my cousins and stuff. So I was always very good with my hands. And growing up, I used to watch uh, Brianna Scurry. She was my, my idol. Um, number one, because she's a female and she's, she's black. And, you know, I never saw anyone like her on the television screen. So it, is, it was like a huge inspiration to see her, her greatness shine. And of course, Oliver Kahn, my number one goalkeeper, he's just a beast. So, I mean, growing up watching them both, it really inspired me to, to pick up the sport and, and play it and, and take it more, more seriously. You think you always had that mentality to be a goalkeeper because people do claim that it's a fairly unique position within football? Yeah, I can remember when I was nine, um, we were we had a club training and, and we did a kind of like a roundabout kind of thing where we would um, take maybe two or three shots and then change and rotate. You know, everybody would, would do that. Um, and, but for me, after maybe like the second shot, I would just, just stay, you know, and they would be like, Nicole, get out of the goal. It's, it's you know, it's Susan's turn to, to take a shot. So it became more like a, I guess I kind of gravitated to it, to it more because I was always very good with my hands. So I would say, yes, I'm a, I'm a natural goalkeeper in that respect. I don't really like to run too much. <laughs> that maybe is a similarity with us all. Yes, I'd agree with that, certainly. Um, and Chloe, aside from kind of the physical attributes maybe uh, that Nicole's talked about in goalkeeping, would you say that there are differences uh, between goalkeepers and outfield players and do you fit kind of that mould as a goalkeeper? Um, I think the goalkeeping game generally, I think, has evolved a little bit. And I think that's sort of, uh, you know, the last few years, I think I've definitely seen that evolution take place. Um, so whereas before, I think, as Nicole was saying, you know, you'd have volleys to hands and sort of work on a few dives and things like that. I think a lot of the game now is, is to do with your technical ability and being able to play the ball out from the back. And, you know, in certain cases, just be that fifth defender. Um, but also, I mean, the game is progressing more and more. And actually, we're starting to be seen as a bit of a line of attack as well. I mean, you know, playing the long balls over, um, you know, and dealing with those kind of like quick counter attacks. So, you know, in terms of, of, you know, growing up, you know, I, I was looking at the likes of, of Schmeichel and, you know, yourself and, and even now, you know, Karen Barsley and, and all the achievements that, the, that you guys have achieved. So, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's been a, a great kind of period to be a goalkeeper, I suppose. So I've kind of gone from sort of seeing that and then to, to develop now into a situation where you're starting to see sort of the, the younger generation come through, the, the Ellie Roebucks, the, the Hannah Hamptons and and sort of uh, uh, looking at how their styles are playing now are, are completely different to maybe how things were, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. So I think it's an exciting time for, for goalkeeping. Uh, and Julie, you pre predominantly work in grassroots goalkeeping. Uh, with your experiences as a goalkeeper, formerly yourself, and now working with grassroots, um, alongside the, the physical and technical capabilities of goalkeepers that you're looking for to find the next Han Hampton, the next Ellie Roebuck, um, are there any kind of mental characteristics that you, you look for specifically with goalkeepers? I think some of the things that stand out for me are when the keepers just, they, they want to learn. They really want to come back and, and listen to what you've got to say. They want to try harder the next time. Let's face it, we don't let goals in. Whatever the coaches say, we do not let goals in. And it's quite frustrating. But equally, we have to understand that we can't save everything. There's a lot um, about decision making and developing decision making. It doesn't matter what size, shape, etc. that you are. If you make a really, if, if you can assess the play that's coming towards you, make a great decision and be in a really good place, the chances are that you're going to make that save. Um, and I say the chances are, it's more likely that you will make that, that save. Um, and I think that we're looking for those people that can make those decisions, that can be confident uh, about that but also that want to learn you know that's the one thing I found with mixing with lots of goalkeepers at different levels is 
that there's just this desire to learn. Everybody wants to take on board things from everyday life, things from what they've seen on the telly, things from other sports. And we, we try and think, well, how can we bring that back into goalkeeping? So I, I just love that, that sort of side of things. And, and sort of that's what I look for. I look for somebody who stands out a little bit like that, that asks those challenging questions that, that I can't answer. And I have to sit back and go, hang on a minute. That was a really great question. Wonder where it came from. How can we develop this and use this as a strength for the goalkeeper? So those are the sorts of things that I look for all the time. Fantastic. I suppose from my own experience as a goalkeeper um, and having been able to reflect on it since finishing, I think characteristics like resilience were really important with a goalkeeper. Um, the capability to get rid of a mistake, to get rid of a brilliant save pretty much instantly to maintain that, um, that you can't have any spikes in your concentration, uh, whether it be up or whether it be down, uh, thinking about what's happened previously which again lends itself to mindfulness and being very much in the present, uh, I, I felt was really important when I was playing. Um, I let loads of goals in and, you know, you've just got to get over it straight away. Uh, even when you're in, you know, hugely pressured situation. I remember 2007, our first ever World Cup uh, in the sort of, in the modern era uh, in China, and we played against the US in the quarterfinals. I remember it well. Yeah, I remember what a game. It. it was great. And then locally... Oh. <laughs> Um, but, you know, we'd not be in a situation of uh, such magnitude, I suppose, and being under the microscope. I remember a legend, Christine Lilly, who played about three billion times for the US at that point, um, came running through, uh, ball bounce. I misjudged it. Poor decision, as Julie was talking about decision. Probably was thinking about, I'm going to stop Christine Lilly rather than the actual bounce of the ball went over my head and she ended up scoring um, a really soft goal. But at the age of 27, my first World Cup, I was able to just switch, get rid of it. Because right there and then it had no positive, um, it had no, there's nothing, there's, I, I didn't need to hold on to that moment at all, other than switch back on to what the next thing was that was going to be happening. And I think that's kind of what I was was talking about as far as goalkeeping I think has a different mentality has that ability to not dwell on mistakes not be buzzing too much off of great saves uh, but being able to take ownership and responsibility for what you've done but also having the um, the clarity of mind to be able to address it when it is um, is okay to address it which is either in those pockets of downtime when someone's down and been fouled when it's half time or whether it's post match. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, that's all stuff that I learned with Misha. It's also kind of lending its, its, um, itself very nicely to my golf game, which we all may laugh about that. But genuinely, I hit a rubbish shot and I'm kind of like, oh, well, next shot. Simple as that. Um, that that's such a hard thing, isn't it, though? It's um, that, that the ability to park self judgment after making a mistake but coming back into the now that is the skill of being present and and um we worked a lot on that um in terms of how you actually do it but for me there are also other characteristics for goalkeepers about how you connect with anybody else and you know i kind of remember you know, one of your great attributes brownie was actually how you connected everybody else together so that ability to speak to the people in front of you, but actually to encourage, to be their eyes, to see things ahead of times, to anticipate. Um, and when, when the keeper is um, present and people can hear you, feel you, they, they, it enhances the security of all of the players in front of you. So whilst you're having to um, manage your own game, to some degree, you also help manage the other bits of the game as well. I think you learn, you, you see thousands of scenarios as you become, uh, you know, older and, and you've, you've played in thousands of games. Uh, you can see those scenarios before they happen. Yeah. And you're right, Misha, I think aligning your back four or your back three, however it is. And I think one of the, the key skills along with that is how to communicate with those people. Yeah. We did a lot in camp with you, Misha, with sports mm -hmm. psychologists about 
recognizing that each of those back four, for example, are different personalities. They're different human beings. And how, for instance, I would talk to my right back would be completely different as to how I would talk to my holding midfielder, mm -hmm. uh, how, I'd, how I would address my, my left back. You know, one would need a rocket up a backside. The other one would need in a little bit of downtime, an arm around the shoulder, a quiet word, out of earshot on it of anyone else. And I think recognizing that um, made my job a heck of a lot easier because you gained not just the respect, but I think the empathy. Mm -hmm. um, if you could have empathy with your teammates, understanding on the pitch so you could instantly get that message across, you know, sh shout their name before you shout the information was a really key thing. Mm -hmm. When I'm talking to young goalkeepers, that was, that's a really important uh, thing on communication is name, information, mm -hmm. and it gets across. Uh, so communication is certainly something uh, I learned has been valuable on and off the pitch uh, from a sort of a, a technical point of view, getting your, point, your, your information across, but off the pitch, you know, assisting with that, that kind of team bonding and that growth of the environment, which in a team sport is, is absolutely, absolutely huge, Misha. Yeah. I remember, sorry, I remember one time we did this thing on communication and basically I wrote down every single thing that the goalkeeper said, like literally verbatim, every single thing. And then we gave it, <laughs> Brian is looking worried. <laughs> we gave it to the players in front, to the defenders and got them to rate it in terms of how helpful is this? Because sometimes a lot of the stuff that you, you're just talking, but actually it's not landing, it has no value. And then once we, all of the, the defenders rated it, then that helped the goalkeeper go, okay, this is helpful. This, no one knew what I was talking about. And you, you might think you have an understanding of it, but actually, you know, the right back's going, yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> so actually the notion of connecting those people together so that the communication, because you have such a small window to get that message across to make sure that those words are meaningful and have purpose. Um, so those, those were some of the exercises that some of the bits that we used to do in England is like just kind of really getting it. So everything was, was very, very precise. And also it helps that understanding because um, I think before we did that, Brownie, you hadn't asked the people in football. So when I say this, does it, is it of any value? Does it mean anything to you? Um, because we kind of just speak, you know, there's like words that come out, but actually, you know, when you say this, it's really helpful. Okay, good. Right. I'm going to do more of that. This one, I don't know what, I really don't know what it means. And um, also language in terms of, you know, I, I, I speak a lot and I'm sort of working with coaches as well. I say, coach the do's, tell people what you do want them to do rather than what you don't want them to do. So no turn. Well, no turn might be better to say, stand tall or squeeze or you know or something that is a doing action rather than a know this and know that um so it's like a two-part process isn't it if you've got to think of what yes what to do and then switch it not what to do that takes longer yep yeah i think i think for me the challenges are a little bit different in terms of um I don't know if it's because we're in, I'm in the middle of the country, so the West Midlands, and, and they're really nice. So I find that the girls are very nice and very polite. And uh, coaching, I only have a few at the moment, go, uh, female goalkeepers, but coaching some of them and getting them to communicate in the first place. I mean, gosh, if they open their mouth and say something, they forget everything else that we've learned, like how to catch a ball and where to move to and all sorts of things like that. So, and And they feel, I think in that developmental phase, they feel as though, they haven't got enough experience anyway to say something. So why should they be controlling the back four? So it's that mm. conversation that we're having about, well, but it's not necessarily controlling the back four, it's working with them. So you, you're a unit with the back four rather than a single entity on your own. And you need to sort of let them know what you're doing and what you would like them to be doing to enhance your own performance as much as anything. But I think, yeah, what, overcoming that, that barrier. I remember um, a young keeper that's gone off to play for a really good club at the moment. And um, she when she did finally open her mouth and start saying things and people started taking notice, then she was exactly as Misha said, she, there was this whole running commentary for about 90 minutes. And even I didn't know what she was saying. Um, but we didn't necessarily have that conversation. I just thought, well, you know, if you're, if you're continually saying something, the, the, the back four are going to switch off and they won't necessarily hear the important things. 
So we were so, sort of thinking about what are the important things, but I'm certainly going to take some of your messages, Mish, in terms of, um, you know, not the don'ts. I mean, I've, I've only been guilty a few times, but no turn is a really easy thing. It's a very mm-hmm. command orientated thing to say. And I have been guilty of promoting that in the past. However, I shall now redress some of that oh, information. Yeah. <laughs> Learn every day. <laughs> Um, yeah. And to Nicole on, on that and to Chloe as well, when you're moving from team to team, I, I played in different countries, Nicole, as, as obviously you have as well, um, that information that you're spouting as a goalkeeper, as that seer of everything, as it were, uh, as what Misha's just said to you or what you've learned previously made you think, actually, do I need to bed down what my information means and do my back four, back three actually understand that information um yeah i think it's important to have good emotional intelligence it's something that i learned in in college actually my college coach she was really big on that i mean she would she wouldn't speak to to me the same way she would speak to maybe a forward or a sense of midfielder you know and it's really important to 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 know to know your teammates you know i'm not going to talk to my center back the same way i talk to my right back because they have two different uh personalities and I think it's really important to know that because when you go to a different country, there's different cultures and different customs. So it's, you have to have that kind of awareness um, in a sense. And you're just like how you guys are just saying, I mean, you, have to, you can't speak to the same person, you know, the same way as you do the other people because the message will not be received the same way. So I think it's, a, it's very important to know your teammates and also know your coaches and, you know, communicate you know, effectively is, is very, very important to me. And I've carried that throughout my entire uh, professional career. And um, Nicole, on that, when you went to the World Cup with Jamaica, um, was that meeting up with teammates that you'd known for a long time? Or was it a fairly, obviously the team are relatively new themselves. Was that a quick kind of team bonding experience? Was it a quick um, trying to get together the team dynamic to be as effective as they could at the World Cup? And yeah, what was, or maybe some of the strategies, sorry to interrupt, uh, that your coaches or you as teammates employed to, to make that as successful as possible? Well, I mean, uh, for the national team, it's, it's, it's a very unique experience because Jamaica, we, we tend to rush things a lot because of funding, and et cetera. So it was a very quick transition, um, but some of the players were relatively new to the program. So um, for me personally, I'm, I was one of the veterans and um, I had to adapt to different personalities and, and kind of get, get to know my teammates quicker than I w- would want to, than I would like to, I should say. Um, but it, it all worked out because we all have the same mentality to go out there and, and you know, achieve the, the common goal, which was to perform at a high level and to, to prove it to a lot of people that we belong. Um, but yeah, it, 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 was, it was a challenge, but um, I think we, we overcame that. You certainly did. It was a pleasure to watch at the World Cup. It was fantastic. Um, right, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to move on to the next question. I'll start with you, Chloe. Uh, there's forever being criticism that women goalkeepers are not as good as male goalkeepers. Uh, There's been um, points of view suggesting goals should be smaller for for women. Um, What are kind of maybe some of the key differences between female and male goalkeepers and what are your views on smaller goals, smaller pitches, etc.? Um, I think in the sort of first instance, I think there's obviously the people who kind of spout these views about, you know, women goalkeepers are are useless or, you know, nine times out of 10, these people haven't seen women's goalkeepers or or sort of paid any kind of attention to to women's sport at at all. Um, So I don't really sort of, you know, I obviously don't agree with that opinion. And I, you know, I I struggle to find any kind of validity in those, those opinions. But, you know, I do appreciate obviously historically, I think less time and attention was given to goalkeeping. So I think obviously for for me growing up, you know, with the resources that are available at at kind of a grassroots level, you definitely found that, you know, your warm up would just be, um, you know, a dad kicking a ball at you or, you know, making a couple of saves on the floor and then just going straight into a game. So, you know, going from kind of that level to now, you know, 15, 20 years later and seeing all the analysis that takes place in terms of, you know, where the shots are likely to be, are they going to be long range? You know, how is your opponent going to attack? Um, What can you do to help with a counter attack? So, you know, goalkeeping, I think, generally for men and women has come, come a long way. But I think especially now there's a, a fantastic focus on female 
goalkeeping and I suppose this group I suppose is is credit to that um I think in terms of the the kind of debate I think Emma Hayes raised it I think is it a year ago two years ago about the 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 kind of goals being a bit smaller because obviously you know it, it makes physical sense because we're you know shorter than the male goalkeepers are generally speaking um you know when it first came out I I, I kind of said I, I just don't agree with that opinion at all but obviously there is some merit to it in terms of physicality and you know, where we're able to reach and our you know the distances of our dives and things like that maybe that's sort of out of proportion to, to what we're able to, to achieve but in the same sense, I suppose it kind of opens up a lot of interesting questions about, you know, maybe the, the pitch should be smaller in proportion then to the goals. And, you know, do we have to have a look at the, the ball size then as well and the penalty area? So, um, you know, and in terms of kind of even just on a logistic and, and practical basis, that, that would then mean that, you know, the proportionality of goals for, for younger female goalkeepers coming up through the game, they'd have to have different goals to, to the boys' teams. So, and, you know, obviously there's a, there's a big struggle at the moment for pitch spaces. So I'm, I'm struggling to see even how, you know, even if there was sort of a, a big consensus of agreement that the goals should be changed, that that would ever come into to, to play, I suppose. Um, you know, for, for me, I suppose, having grown up with just one size goal, I suppose the kind of main concern I'd have is obviously that, that you know, both sides of the pitch are, are equal. So both teams are dealing with the same surfaces, the same goal size is the same kind of area the same ball obviously so you're always going to have that kind of equality I suppose in in arms with with the opposition so in terms of the the goal I think that's something that we've just had to deal with as a as a female player um and I think that's I, I can't really see it being being changed going forwards but it's definitely a very a very interesting question yeah I think Emma Hayes likes to provoke um what's the word not contention, but uh, discussion. And I think that's yes. helpful for the game. Absolutely. Uh, as far as my own personal experiences, I mean, I'm 5'7". Five, 5'8 seven. Five, on my bio, but 5'7". Uh, as being a goalkeeper, uh, that's not particularly helpful. Uh, but what you do have to do is the goal was never going to change size, and I don't think it ever will. And you're right, it's the only inanimate object on the pitch that a, a, a actual, it's not player-to-player -player battle. It's player against the inanimate object of the goal. Um, so that is the, the only scenario on the pitch where that happens. So we worked on agility, so your speed of, of footwork. Uh, we worked on positioning. You're talking about long range shots. So my position has to be different because I'm five foot seven compared to a male goalkeeper who's six foot five. Simple as that. Uh, same with uh, through, through balls and being on your front foot. Positioning had to slightly alter. That was a given because of my physical stature compared to a male goal goalkeeper. Um, I don't agree that rules, uh, goals should be changed. I just think that we need to continue to up our game. And I think, you know, say you, you when I was playing, say 10 years ago, um, and it was on the cusp of being shown on TV and suddenly everybody had an opinion about female goalkeepers because for the first time ever they could see them. Um, and, you know, they were comparing the likes of, of myself um, against, you know, whoever was in goal for England at the time, um, who was probably six foot two, six foot three. And let's just say women's football is women's football, men's football is football. Yes, it's football, but there are subtle differences. We don't have a problem with it. You know, I don't give, I didn't give up football because the goals were too big. You know, you get on with it and you, you, you challenge yourself to improve in the areas, the physical and technical and I think the reading of our game had to be better than the men because we couldn't just make point blank saves or we couldn't just um, you know wait to the last minute uh, dive over to the left and make a top corner save because if our positioning needed to be a meter or a yard higher up so that we could make that save at, on its trajectory as it's moving towards that top corner earlier that's how we had to make the save. So it's subtleties in, in training. I think um, watching your analysis of games on, on, uh, on video always helped massively. Uh, about, so you could look at your positioning, you could look at your timing of decision-making, I think had to be just that fraction bit quicker than the men's. Um, but, you know, it's a healthy debate to have. Julia, when you're teaching or coaching your young players um, in the kind of forethought that they're not going to be six foot five are there are some differences with young female goalkeepers that you would work on compared to if you were to be working with the next um you know premier league goalkeeper size wise 
Yeah, definitely. Like you say, there's different starting positions. So how far people would start from outside the, um, you know, away from the goal line. And I think that's really important. I think if you're not that big, you've got to make some um, better or different decisions to, to give yourself the best chance of making that save. Um, I think my emotional response is really big and I feel this rant coming on about, um, you know, the size of goals. I'm like, no, no, leave them alone. How dare you? It's like having an almost marathon for women. Oh, they almost ran the marathon because they can't, can't quite make the 26.2 miles. You know, I sit there and think, hang on, wait a minute. Why, why are we doing this? And who's making um, that, that sort of discussion? Yes, I looked at Emma Hayes's response because I was quite surprised thinking, really, what's she doing? Do, you know, making those sorts of comments. But she was going on about height. Well, I've, I've looked at quite a lot of things uh, in relation to key demands for, for goalkeepers, so phys physical and technical stuff. Yes, height is important, but it's not the most important factor, as you've already said um, yourself, Rachel, you know, the, the agility. And we're starting to learn how to not only train women better, but how to train goalkeepers better, as Chloe alluded to earlier. So I think when you look back at 2012 and, and um, some of the, Euro, the, the, the Euro tournaments where the goalkeepers were being, women goalkeepers were being slammed essentially and it was quite painful to listen to some of the, the, the broadcasters comments and everything but then 2019 for me the World Cup's brilliant okay for me this was a goalkeeper World Cup and I absolutely loved it I was sitting there jumping up and down when everyone was making a save never mind the, 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 um, the goals and I think that was phenomenal on the other side so I try and be less emotional and I, I've pulled out a few really really quick stats here um, and at the, at the risk of being a Mike West, please don't uh, uh, confuse me with him on the final score, reading out the, the Saturday scores. You know, women's, the, the WSL in February, just before lockdown this year, we've got West Ham United 4, Liverpool 2. Am I, am I doing well at this? So 4-2. Well, yes, we could also then, and I see there is a West Ham coach here, we could also then say, well, what about the men's game? And the men's game, West Ham 4 and who do they play? Watford won a rare win for West Ham. But, but you know, you, we're suddenly sitting there going, but there's not a massive difference. We're not winning 10 and 20 nil or something like that in some of these games. They are quite close. There's a lot of 1-1 one, one scores. Um, I think probably at the sub-elite and the developmental levels, there are some bigger scores um, where, where we are seeing some of these teams winning 12 nil, etc. But I think that that's mainly down to the fact that you have one coach for a team of a lot of people of which only one person is the goalkeeper. And therefore, we're not going to spend all of that time looking at, at how to help the goalkeeper. So they sort of have to grow up and coach themselves. And that's one of the whole reasons that I became a goalkeeper coach to try and, you know, redress that balance a little bit and, and coach as many people as I can who, were, who wanted to make it up to, you know, through the levels. So but that happens in, in, with the boys as well, Julia. It's like yes. in the academies, you often have games with huge, big scores. So it's it's not really different, is it? Do you think it helps to develop the resilience of the goalkeeper if we can get them through that? Because you've got the micro dotting goal when they transition to the to the big eleven aside aside sure. goals, and I think sometimes I coach uh, show me the shape. You're not going to make yeah, the yeah. save, but show me the shape because one day when you've gone through your growth spurt, you're actually going to touch that ball. Yeah. So if you show me the shape now, while she might be a little bit away from that, that ball, that then at some point you're actually going to make it. But as I said, I think we're looking at the decisions. Yeah, and also coaching the anticipation and the decision-making skills. That, because actually um, those, are the, those are also really, really critical. And, you know, Rachel, what you were talking about is that you had to anticipate what was happening sooner because you had to intercept earlier on the ball's um, trajectory. So if you're not understanding about tracking the flight of the ball and being present and understanding that and moving in relation to it, it doesn't matter if you're six foot five. Um, and also there are, there are very tall women, you know, they're not dots. There are tall women who are really competent and really able to do their job. Um, but you get the dots in, you know, I, I, I work in an academy, so I see, you know, all of it the whole way down and, you get dots in the boys game as well. So it's not hugely different. It, re it really isn't. Um, I think in terms of that growth and that transition, it's about how you 
make decisions and how you uh, how you get people to play in the now um how you get them to understand the cues we used to do a lot on those cues it's like which bit of the body do you need to focus on that's going to help you tell you whether they're going left whether they're going right those kind of intricacies um, for coaches are really important um well for coaches to coach i think in terms of goalkeeper coaches understanding that 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 level of detail really um, just talking about your experiences across academies and Nicole, you said you work with children as well. I assume that's within, within football, if I'm wrong, tell me. But um, other, we've had a question from um, one of the attendees about uh, the differences or if there are differences of working with boys or working with girls. Are either of them harder to coach, different to coach? Hmm. Go with Nicole. Um, I wouldn't say harder, um, different. with girls, yeah, it's different. Yeah. <laughs> with girls, you have to be more emotionally in tune. You have to kind of stroke their ego a bit more to keep them engaged based on my experience. Um, whereas with boys, you tell them to do something and they'll do it. But with girls, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to explain because with girls, they're, they're more, they're more focused. They, they will do the, the, the exercise, you know, correctly or whatever, but you kind of have to explain it a little bit differently so they can kind of understand it um, better, effectively. Uh, whereas with boys, they'll kind of like manipulate it and, and make, make the drill their own, kind of. You know, girls are a little bit more calculated based on my experiences. But I personally, I prefer to work with, with girls because I see myself in them because um, they want to get better. It's a little bit easier to work with them because they're, they're, they'll be the ones to ask questions and, and try to, you know, be perfectionists as opposed to boys, they'll just, you know, do whatever they want. Misha, from your experiences across different sports, not just in football, not just in goalkeeping, what's your perception on the difference between girls and boys coaching? Yeah, them? I mean, I think um, I've worked, obviously, as a psychologist with, elite men and elite women. And um, I think that m men trip up over different things. I think they trip up over the fact that they don't have, maybe they're not as aware of their own emotional landscape and how to use it. And whereas women are better at that, but sometimes women get caught up in that. Um, I think in terms of, um, and again, it depends where you are in that transition, you know, um, whether you're just focused on yourself in terms of understanding the world from your perspective. Boys, men, very good at doing that. Not so good at doing empathy and understanding what it looks like from an, another perspective. Women much better at doing that generally um, and having the language to describe those differences. So I kind of spend a lot of time when I'm working with men, boys, is getting them to actually connect with some of that emotional landscape and using it to a benefit. So um, if you take the thing of, it, of empathy, sometimes in, in the men's game, if somebody hasn't passed the ball, they're going to get really mad because uh, they can't see the world from someone else's perspective. And you go, well, maybe this person didn't see you make that run. Oh yeah, I never thought about that. But meanwhile, you've just dumped on him, had a whole argument with him. But actually, if you had some empathy, you might see that actually the world from his perspective was different. Um, so, you know, but the, the essence of being an elite player, what drives you, it, it feels very similar. It feels very similar to me. Lots of vulnerabilities in both groups. By the way, men are just as vulnerable as women. They, they might put up a mask and not own it um, in, in the way that women do. Um, but I have had versions of the same conversation as, that I was having with you, Brownie. I'm having those conversations with the male players that I work with. So not better, not worse, just different. Just different, but also really similar. Yeah. Also really similar. Yeah. 
I suppose my general kind of view on after having coached a bit with both is that certainly on the pitch, players are within uh, in men's football or, or boys' football, they'll just say it. They'll have it out with that player on the pitch, whereas female players more so will keep it in and take it off, chat about it within their little groups on occasions and not necessarily clear the air. Um, that's something as a coach, if I get into coaching, fingers crossed I will eventually, that I will definitely look to, from a team dyma- na- dynamic, look to provide a platform for, to ensure that once everybody's gone out of the changing rooms, once they've over that white line, having finished the, the match, nothing is unsaid, if you get me. No. Everything is... But is, is I out. think there's sometimes that's an assumption though, because there are those players who are really good, the male players at dumping, having a go, but there are also those players that actually are quiet and that impacts on them and it makes them feel really humiliated or belittled and they don't have a voice. So, you know, one of the themes, one of my themes often is how do you ensure everybody has a voice? So um, providing a platform for everybody. Yes, a- absolutely. I mean, because that's, that's, that's really, really important that we, that we hear each other, we value our differences um, and recognize that even though I might be quiet, I might not be saying something, I still have valuable things to contribute. Um, okay, I'm yeah. seeing your tongue on my screen now, which means that we've run out of time. Um, I was going to ask one final question it's about performance analysis, video analysis. Like it or hate it, goalkeepers? Julia? I think it's really important. We don't know enough because I've looked at some of the research and pulled some themes together. We don't really know enough to be able to train some of these things. So please, please, please go away, do some video analysis, share your results with us. Let us know what the keepers are doing both on and off the ball, which is important. Chloe, love it or hate it? Absolutely love it. I think it's such an integral part of the game now. Um, You know, if I go out into the field, I want to make sure that I've got as much information as possible about you know, even left or right footed, where the attacks are going to come from, you know, what kind of style of corner they normally play for, set plays. Um, you know, I want to go out there armed with everything I possibly can in order to give me the, a better chance of anticipating where that ball is likely to go. So I'm all for analysis. It's sometimes a little bit tedious, but it needs to be done. Nicole, you analysing your own performance? Absolutely. I think it's very important. I mean, holding, holding us accountable is very important. How are we going to know our our mistakes, how are we going to correct them and, and become a better player and a better teammate? I'm all for it. And it helps build that resilience that we all know as goalkeepers, we have buckets of. Thanks, Joe, And thank you very much, everybody, for being on the panel. It's been a real pleasure to chat goalkeeping with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Yeah, just to echo what Rach just said, that was incredible. Um, I think we can all agree we could probably do another hour. So um, thank you so much, Julia, Chloe, Misha, Nicole. You've been amazing. I think, I mean, I've scribbled down hundreds of notes just about stuff you were saying that actually I think we can probably um, use in everyday life. Loads of stuff about resilience. I love the stuff about getting over making a mistake so quickly, but also getting over making a brilliant save and kind of being in the moment. I thought that was I think we can all use that in everyday life. Control the controllables, absolutely. That's what definitely what we've all had to do in the last few months and can can use going forward. Um, so many thoughts. I'm sure we didn't we didn't get half of the questions that you've all put in the chat. So apologies. We can continue the discussion over on Twitter at Women in Football. Um, if you've got any feedback, and as I said at the beginning of the webinar, anything you'd like us to cover or do going forward events at womeninfootball.co.uk. We will be running more of these over the next few weeks. So look out for your emails in your inboxes. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care, all of you. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Brownie, I have... Here's a picture that's on my wall. I'll sat on the bench again, Mish. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what was going on there. It was like, but it's... uh, it reminds me of all of those really special people that I was very lucky to work with. And uh, all of you have gone on to do such amazing things, you know, from, from that group of women. Um, it was really a pivotal moment, gen- genuinely. You know, I think we kind of were running out of self-belief and uh, kind of um, resilience maybe at that time and, and needed a bit of a kickstart and a refresher of the environment certainly um, that we were supposed to be enjoying as national team players 
Mm -hmm. um, so to freshen it up, give us a new perspective on things, a new uh, maybe way of being able to have awkward, difficult conversations um, was really empowering. So, mm -hmm. and it's stuff that stuck with me and still to this day, I use on a daily basis, genuinely. Uh, right, I'm going to leave you lot to have your private discussions. <laughs> Get yourselves on some FaceTime or some, uh, some uh, Zoom calls with the catch up. Thank you again, all of you, and um, look after yourselves. Thanks. Take care.